All right, everybody, we are going to get started. Uh, there will probably be a couple of folks trickling in, and that is okay, kid drop off, so on and so forth. Uh, so a couple of words of preamble uh, before we dive in. Uh, you'll notice uh, the opening activity. Uh, a clover, and egg, and some water walk into an analogy. I want you to spend a few minutes around your table talking about some analogies that you have heard uh, to kind of illustrate the Trinity and to explain it. Uh, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Um, just to show my cards. I don't think analogies are always the best way to teach the Trinity. I do also think most people use analogies about the Trinity because they're earnestly seeking to understand something that's difficult. So um, if someone at your table, for instance, says, well, I've always heard of the Trinity like a clove, you know, it's a three-leaf clover. Please don't throw a brick at them and yell heretic, okay? Talk about, hey, what might that illustrate that's helpful? Where might that go off the rails? And then we'll talk about it in about five minutes. So analogies, discuss them around your table, and go. All right. I know that was a quick uh, four and a half minutes. Um, we're going to go ahead and cut it there because we have quite a few things to, to dive into. On the scale of nervousness uh, in times that I've taught that I might say something heretical, this one pegs kind of the end of it. This is a super intricate doctrinal discussion, uh, so I want to make sure that we have enough time for me to kind of speak slowly and clearly. Uh, I, I'm not going to ask what uh, analogies you've heard. I'll just tell you ones that I've heard and try to give a charitable rendering for why that is. Uh, typically, theologians nowadays will say, hey, let's stay away from analogies, because what they, they end up doing is they can end up warping a correct understanding, even as they're trying to clarify it. So, for instance, you may have heard the analogy of like, well, if God is Father, Son, and Spirit, that's kind of like me. I'm a father of two kids, um, and I'm also a son, and then I also have some other roles, right? Which is, you can see how that's trying to get at the Trinity. The problem is, is that God is... All three of those things at all times. He's one God. He's not stepping into different roles. He is all three persons simultaneously. All three persons of, are of equal essence, and they are separate persons and one God, right? So the analogy kind of breaks down there. You may have heard, again, uh, the analogy of, you know, God is kind of like water. He's, you know, water is uh, steam, and it's ice, and it's liquid, uh, and so God is Father, Son, and Spirit. Again, you see where that's trying to go? Those are different things, and yet the same thing. And yet, God doesn't sometimes show up as the Son, sometimes show up as the Spirit, sometimes show up as the Father. So you can think, think about this. Like when I hear somebody you know, using an analogy for the Trinity, I don't immediately think that person's trying to lead people astray. I usually think that person is trying to explain something really, really difficult, and that's the way that we typically uh, attempt to do that is by making an analogy, right? So let's just imagine your Sunday school teacher or your parents weren't trying to turn you into a heretic. Let's, let's acknowledge for a moment that the Bible does clearly articulate three persons in one God. And that is a very difficult category to wrap our head around. There is quite literally no one like him, right? There's no, nothing we can point to to go, oh yeah, it's just like that over there, right? This is difficult. And so it makes sense that there's going to be difficulty in explaining it. The Bible teaches there is one God and there are three persons who are described as being distinct from one another and yet also equally divine. And yet in the Trinity we see actions like the Son submitting to the Father, the Spirit doing the will of the Son and the Father, the Father glorifying the Son and the Son glorifying the Father and the Spirit glorifying the Son and the Father. And so this section of church history is dedicated to how has the church tried to explain that? Where has that debate kind of gone off the rails? The Trinity is difficult to articulate, not impossible, as we will see by the end of our time together. But I just want to lead us away from some chronological snobbery of going, well, of course, they should have just explained it like that, because you and I are the beneficiaries of 2,000 years of church history clarifying and articulating this. So I want to begin with some humility. I would also love to pause for a moment and ask the Lord for help. So would you pray with me? Father, we are seeking to understand the way our brothers and sisters down through the ages have understood who you to be. You are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons in one God. Would you, I know it is early in the morning, and perhaps the coffee isn't working yet, but would you give us grace just for the next few moments to be able to grasp something of the ineffable nature of God? Would you be with us and help us? It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so 
Uh, just by way of introduction, um, how heresy typically gets started. We're going to be looking at a heretic this morning, Arius and Arianism, which is associated with Arius. The way it typically gets started, again, is not with like some shady guy off in the back corner, like, um, you know, in a trench coat and sunglasses saying like, you, you want some other views of God. That's not how it happens. Typically what happens is there is a poor explanation for a difficult topic that's two degrees off. And then when it continues to be two degrees off and is carried forward, you end up doing something like denying the Trinity. That's what happens this morning. So just to think about this with me for a moment, like I've often heard uh, some Christians who see the difficulty of life and how scary it is and the, the horrible things that happen. They go, well, I don't, how do you reconcile that with like the sovereignty of God? If God is good and in control of all things and we see all these things around us. And so well, maybe it is that like God is not... Like fully in control. Maybe he doesn't know the future kind of until we make decisions uh, and it happens. Uh, and then maybe he's, he's kind of reacting to that. He's powerful, but maybe not fully in control. You see how that's an, uh, seeking to explain something in the world around us. That, that theological heresy is called open theism, by the way. That, that's incorrect. But you can see how somebody's trying to grapple with that, maybe not with the biblical text, but just emotionally. Uh, another example might be uh, when somebody reads again and again of what we see in the, uh, the pages of Scripture about the sovereignty of God. And they go... Okay, well, that makes sense. So if God's sovereign, like, it really doesn't matter. Anything that we do, we don't really make any real choices, and we really we'll just find out who's elect when we get to heaven. That, that would be called hyper-Calvinism. It is a heresy. But you can see how somebody, bad argument from some biblical data, ends up far afield, even trying to explain something that's difficult. That's how heresy happens. And this morning, we are looking at the Nicene Creed. That's how you say that word. It's not Nicene, it's Nicene. Uh, which was formulated first at the Council of Nicaea. That's how it gets its name. Uh, Nicaea is the place. The Nicene Creed is the creed that came out of this big meeting of the whole church. It was refined at the Council of Constantinople in 381. So let me give you a quick disclaimer because this is really important. Some of you have studied this. Some of you have not. Uh, So if you have studied this, I'm, I, what I'm fixing to do is give a 30,000-foot explanation. So it would be akin to describing the American Revolution like this. There were some people that were fed up with the King of England. They were in the colonies, and they, they had had it. So they decided to form their own country. England didn't like that, so they fought a war. Americans were led by George Washington. They won. They became their own country. Right? Is that true? Yes. Has more been written about the American Revolution than that? Also, yes, right? So just recognize what we're doing here. We're trying to wrap our minds around a huge theological subject. Uh, So there's going to be some summary. So if you've never studied this before, I want to invite you to unplug for just one moment. If you have studied this before, here are the things we are not going to cover. I am aware they exist. We don't have time to get into them today. The debate that takes place between 325 and 381, the discussion of the homoousius clause, the discussion of the filioque clause. Uh, I would encourage you to read about that in the resources put down below. Some of our folks in the cohort are writing papers on that. We just don't have time to dive into those intricacies. They do exist. There are some differences between the first and second versions of the Nicene Creed, as well as the Latin translations. It does become more liturgical. There are no anathemas in the second version. There were in the first. You can read about that, again, in the extended resources. We're not going to launch into an extended discussion of the Platonist influence on the early church and its reflective merits. There's a ton of current historiography about Christian Platonism, Neoplatonism, and the interrelationship between the two. I would encourage you to read Matt Barrett on that issue, as well as several others that Spencer would be glad to point you to. I am aware of those. We don't have time to get into that today. It will put half of us to sleep. It might make the other half of us mad. We just want to focus on the big picture of what is going on at Nicaea. Was that a fair enough disclaimer? All right, everybody plug back in. Let's dive in. Here's what's going on. Uh, I already have a typo on the first page of the handout. It was a rough morning. 324 AD, not 325 AD, 324 AD. Constantine, Emperor Constantine, reunifies the Roman Empire. And converts to Christianity. I know, I know, I know. If you read about this, there's some questions about conversion. Was it legitimate or not? However, for the purpose of politics, becomes Christian, stops the persecution of Christians. Now, all of a sudden, going to church is cool again. I mean, not not really, but going to church is no longer something that gets you fed to the lions, right? That's a big, big deal. Because up to this point in church history, it's been a pretty dicey proposition. And so now that Christians are not going to be killed for believing there are some major things that happen, like they can gather together and have a major church council like the Council of Nicaea. So 
That's what's happening kind of in the world, in the area of the world we're in. There's a reunification of the Roman Empire, and the emperor is now a Christian. New thing, all right? Here's what's happening culturally in the area that we're talking about. Greco-Roman, if you're wondering who the Grecos are, them's the Greeks, folks. Greeks, Romans, they have their own system of gods, right? Um, you may know about this. If, don't, if you don't, just watch Hercules. It'll explain all the things. Uh, the Disney animated movie. There's probably a, a live action one, but don't watch that. Watch the animated one. Uh, there are a variety of gods, goddesses, and kind of creatures in between who are sort of human, sort of god. Here's what I want you to, to see about this. There's a dotted line down there at the bottom of the page. That's not a separator. It's at the bottom of page one. Above that line, I want you to put God. Below that line, I want you to put creation. Here's what's going on. In, in pagan societies, and again, there's, there's a couple of varieties of them. You have high and low pagans. Um, you can get into that, if you, again, if you read the resources below. Uh, but the line between God and creation is kind of blurry, right? And it's possible to promote and kind of demote, depending on which system you're in. That's why the line is dotted, right? So the concept, they wouldn't use the term salvation, but the, the, the goal of the human life is to attain to the divine sphere, to, to be able to get up there. And there's a variety of ways that they would articulate doing that. Some of it might just be like ritual observance, offering sacrifices, doing those kinds of things to specific gods, goddesses, in Rome, the emperor. Other systems of pagan religion would have morality. This is typically where you get into like high paganism. A lot of philosophy, living a really moral kind of upstanding life, would allow you to kind of promote, again, you see the odds, sometimes demoting as well, or at least muddling the line. It's important that you know God, creation, fuzzy, right? You can go up and down, and uh, it, you can do that on your own power. Right? That's, that's the goal. Whether it be through good, moral living, or offering sacrifices, you can go up and down. Right? So, Platonism, and that's a big word, Platonism is a Greek philosophy. And for you philosophers in here, please don't throw something at me for this sentence. That believed that humans could rise up to the divine realm. It's more complicated than that, but at base, through the... Living of a good life, humans could rise up to the divine realm. It conceptualized one kind of big God. This is your next blank. The One. Capital O, The One. Right? Sometimes articulated as wisdom. But The One. There is a, there is a big power. There are also lesser divine powers. Uh, two of which, the Logos, or slash the Word, capital W, or... Also, the words, the world's soul, or spirit. You're going to see where I'm going with this in just a second. Spirit is the next plank. So, highest God, the one, lesser gods, the logos, word, the world soul, spirit. These would help human beings live lives that would lead them into the divine realm. Now, some of you may have picked up on this. This is going to cause a problem. It's going to cause a problem. We'll come back to that in just a moment, right? But that's kind of what's happening philosophically, culturally around this period. It's going to matter for what happens at Nicaea, right? we got our, our brains wrapped around that. All right, now, that should be seen, that Platonist view of salvation, moral living, leading you to the divine realm, being assisted by the Logos and the world soul. That's different than what Christians believe, right? And have, we looked at the, the Apostles' Creed last week. The Christian doctrine of salvation, there is no blurring the line between God and creation. Apart from God coming down, there's no blurring. You could also put there's no crossing the line between God and creation apart from God coming down, which he does twice. Once at the incarnation, once at Pentecost, in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right? This is God coming down. You'll note a solid line. Above that solid line, you should write God. Below that solid line, you should write creation. All right, this is the Christian understanding. There is an irrevocable separation, right? God is distinct from his creation, and there is no crossing up. He came down. That's what Christians believe. That's what happens in the incarnation. That's what happens at the indwelling of the Spirit at Pentecost. It's not like, man, if you do enough good stuff, like the Son of the Spirit, they'll help you out. 
and you can kind of promote. No, God must come down to us. This is the Christian doctrine of salvation. You can see how this is at odds with what's going on in the surrounding culture, right? Does it make sense? Are you tracking with me so far? Anybody asleep? Raise your hand if you're asleep. Excellent. All right, so it's just, uh, oh, John said I'm just brushing his hair back. By the way, I forgot to tell you my favorite quote in this whole handout. It was Josh Price. Uh, yesterday, I was texting him about this. It's on your first page. No pressure not to screw up the most enduring and used creed of all of church history. So, uh, Minister of Encouragement, Joshua Robert Price. All right. So, you can see there's a cultural understanding of salvation that involves kind of good works and promoting. There's the Christian understanding of salvation, which requires God come down. Here's the problem, all right? And I've entitled this section of the handout, The Problem. Vocabularies and dictionaries. Vocabularies and dictionaries is the blank. This is a helpful way to understand even a lot of problems in our own life. We might be using the same vocabulary as other people. We are probably sometimes using a different dictionary as other people. And that's certainly happening in Platonism and Christianity. You will note, John calls Jesus the Word, the Logos, right? Different understanding of the Word, the Logos, than Platonism, right? The Spirit is all over the New Testament. However, it is different than the Spirit described by Platonism. So we have a vocabulary problem where Christianity is using a different dictionary. And, again, Christians are not removed from the society, right? They're, they're, not, they're not leaving when they become saved and never hearing anything that other people around them are saying, right? They are in their society, which leads to, and again, large implications here, Arius. Arius is an elder in Syrian Antioch. He's a presbyter. Uh, sometimes you'll read about him and it'll say he's a presbyter, presbyter, elder. That was his role. He believed salvation was an upward movement of the soul toward God with the help of the Son. You can see some influence here of Platonism that's going on, right? It's just, and even not just Platonism, but just the pagan religions in which he dwelt. You can also see, to be charitable to Arius, how it is possible to confuse these categories. Can you not? Right? Again, he's not going, Jesus was an alien. He is saying, okay, yeah, the Son, I get that. Like, he helps us on our journey towards God. Let me read you a quote from uh, Fairbairn and Reeves. I've recommended this book several times. It's at the end of the handout. If there really was a hard line between God, who's uncreated, and everything else created by God, then it would seem that the Son, who in Arius' mind must be lower because of the Platonic trinity of unequals that was influencing Arius, the Son would have to be below that line and thus a creature. Right? So again, Arius' is understanding, look, there is a God who is eternally uncreated. He has existed for all time. There never was a time where He was not. However, the Son is, is begotten of the Father. That's the debate surrounds this word begotten. So Arius argues that there was a time when the Son was not. And because of that, He fits in this category of creation. Right? He is a created being. Let me read to you from a letter that Arius wrote the Bishop of Alexandria, whose name was Alexander. So that's easy to remember. In 318, Arius writes this. He says, We acknowledge one God, the only unbegotten, the only eternal. We're saying amen at this point. The only one without cause or beginning. The only true, the only one possessed of immortality. The only wise, the only good, the only sovereign. Again, we're saying amen. The begetter of his only son before endless ages through whom he made both the ages and all that is, begetting him, here's where it gets tricky, not in appearance, but in truth, giving him subsistence by his own will, begetting him immutable and unchanging, the perfect creation of God. The Son, timelessly begotten by the Father, created and established before all ages, did not exist prior to his begetting but was timelessly begotten before all things. He alone was given existence directly by the Father, for He is not eternal or co-eternal or equally self-sufficient with the Father. I want you to notice something here. That language is super, super close to what we see in Scripture. And it is super, super far away. From what we see in Scripture, right? Taking biblical language, like that He was the only begotten Son of God, 
and saying, I believe that. I believe that God begot him before all things. And what that means is there was a time when he was not. Now we've left, right? We were within the rule of faith. We do believe Jesus is the only begotten son of the father, full of grace and truth, right? We do believe that he is the only son of God. We do not believe that there was a time when he was not, nor did the early church. This is an invention, but it's a close invention, right? So we see how this is a problem. You also see how he gets there from the surrounding culture and how he's trying to make sense of something. Again, just imagining for a moment, this is why things like this, the Institute, things like corporate worship, things like our Bible studies really matter. Because ideally, you would have somebody come alongside areas and go, close, very far away. Let me, let me fix that for you. This is actually what Scripture teaches. And yet, that's not what happens. So the key issue here, again, if you're struggling to hang on, man, there's a lot of philosophy, Platonism, weird words. The key issue is here at the bottom of page two. Whether there was a time when there was no sun. That's what we're trying to figure out. Arius' contention is there was a time when there was no sun. That's what the early church has got to figure out. By the way, if you ever talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, this is very close to what they believe, right? The, the, the Son is the first created being, and then by Him, God creates everything else. So he is, he is the firstborn of all creation, right? Fail to understand the use of the word firstborn, but this is very close. So if you're trying to create a corollary, Jehovah's Witnesses would be very close to this. And so the resulting position, if you look at page 3, there's a line at the top of the page. Arius's position would be that there is God above the line. And below the line, you would have Christ and creation, right? Above the line is God. And below the line is Christ and creation. Christ super important, super exalted, right? We're not, we're not saying Jesus is just like, well, God picked Joe. Sorry, we do have a couple of Joes in here. Uh, Dave, Sam, Larry, whoever, Doug. Uh, but God picked some person and then kind of promoted them. No, 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 the son is like, before anything else was here, God created him, begotten, endlessly, right? He is, he is the, the, the big cheese of all creation. That's what Arius is saying. It's not an unexalted position, but it is a created position, right? That's why this is an issue. That's why we call Arius a heretic. It's not just because we don't like him. Heretic literally means that you have left, right? You have departed from sound doctrine. So we need a solution to this large problem because, again, Arius doesn't just write this in a letter and send it off and say, hey, what do you think, right? He's teaching He's gathering followers. We're going to see over a couple of weeks. This is not something that just goes away. Uh, but because we now have a Christian emperor, um, there's this meeting. So imagine, here's the way it works, right? Uh, Alexander, the bishop of Alexandria, calls together this meeting. It's called a synod. It's like a small local meeting, like in Georgia, right, of church leaders to kind of hash this out. And they do. They say, this is bad. This is not correct. We don't believe this. The Bible doesn't teach this. But Arius' influence has spread. Thankfully, at that little Georgia meeting, uh, there is the theological advisor to the emperor. He's the dude that heads up that local meeting. So he goes to Constantine and says, here's the deal, buddy. He said it in Greek, I'm sure. Uh, but our problem is, not really, that was just a joke. He says, our problem is, we figured this out, but we need to let the whole church know. right? So we need a bigger meeting. Right? That's what I say to Josh all the time. I need more space. We need a bigger meeting. We need to call a council. So all of the leaders from all of the church. Again, we're not on like seven different continents at this point. So there is an invitation sent out to 1,800 bishops, more or less. Uh, and then about 315 of those attended, somewhere in that ballpark. So it is a meeting, an ecumenical council, a meeting of the whole church, they gather together in this place called Nicaea, and they produce what we now call the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed. It's not just because it's nice, although Kevin, like, great, great pun earlier. It is nice. But it's the Nicene Creed. So they gather together basically to certify the findings of the smaller council and disperse them to the church at large. This is before Twitter. Twitter would have maybe saved some time. I don't know. But it was articulated clearly. There's a bunch of stuff that happens in between 325 and 381. And in 381, they add a little bit more to it at the Council of Constantinople. So what we call the Nicene Creed today is in actuality the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. And the blank there is that that is fun to say. So 
what, what we're about to read is the Nicene Creed. What we typically refer to as the Nicene Creed is the product of both of these councils. Uh, the, in Constantinople, they, they clarify a little bit. They add to it. So I'm going to ask that you would not turn away from page 3. I'm going to ask that you stay on page 3. What they come up with is really, really important. I didn't place another line on here because I want you to do it yourself. Off to the side there, which would draw another line. What the Nicene Creed is going to articulate is, above the line, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Below the line, creation. That's what we're going to see. Above the line, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God. Three persons and one God. Equal essence. Right? Below the line, creation. Right? That's what Nicaea is attempting to correct. All right? Sometimes, by the way, you'll hear people say Nicaea. They just mean the Nicene Creed what came out of that council. So here's what we're going to do. For about 10 minutes, give or take, probably give a little bit, maybe between 10 and 15 minutes, uh, I want you to imagine that you have received a very fancy invitation from Emperor Constantine. All right, you're going to gather together. You have in front of you, and this is what happened actually at the council, uh, they, 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 again, from all over the church, would bring the creeds that they recited in their local churches. We talked about this some last week, baptismal symbols, those creeds that they recited at baptism. They had those before them. In fact, we know that because we've recovered a lot of those baptismal symbols. We talked about it last week. I had somebody ask, I've listed one here, a prototypical Greek creed. I had somebody ask, like, I googled that, I couldn't find it. So this is from uh, August Hans Bibliothek der Symbol und Glaubensregel. It was a German kind of summary of some of these baptismal creeds uh, from the early church in the East. You can find it online. Uh, The creeds are in Greek. The narration is in German. If you read those two languages, it will be helpful. If you don't, we've translated it here. Uh, And so hopefully it will be helpful to you. As you gather at this council, what's going on is you have these things in front of you, right? Uh, You have, I came from this place. We recite this in our church service every week. And they kind of, from those, develop this other creed. So what I want to ask you to do is around your table for the next 10 to 15 minutes, I want you to read, without flipping to the next page, this prototypical Greek creed. And I want you to say, just like we did with the Apostles' Creed last week, this is good, right? We would agree with these things. What might need to be clarified in light of this heresy that's going on led by Arius? Arius is saying, we believe in the Son. We believe in the Father. We believe they're both divine. Ish. One of them did not exist at one point in time, but he was eternally begotten before anything else was made. And by him, everything else was made. Right? What would you expand here? What needs further you know, enlarging, clarification? Uh, and then we'll talk about that, and then we'll read what they wrote in 325 and 381 and talk about it for the rest of our time. So put your heads together, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, maybe right out underneath, in between the lines, down at the bottom of the page, what needs to be added. Ready, set, go. By the way, I will not call you out and call you a heretic because you missed something at the end. All right, there's no grade here. All right, go. Hey, sorry, real quick. Uh, been eavesdropping. Uh, so you're going to write out uh, just together things that need to be added. Let me read this aloud for us real quick because I, I realize now that nobody's actually read this until walking in here. Apologize. So this is a prototypical Greek creed given at baptism. We believe in one God, the Almighty Maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, begotten of the Father before all ages, through whom also all things came to be. 
who for us came down from heaven and became incarnate, was born of the Virgin Mary, and was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and was buried, and rose on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come in glory to judge the living and the dead. Of His kingdom there will be no end. We believe also in one Holy Spirit, the giver of life, and in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Again, remember, lowercase there, universal from the apostles. One baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the dead, and the kingdom of heaven, and in life everlasting. Amen. All right, go. All right. We'll, uh, we'll try to bring this back together. Uh, again, so what you have in front of you, the prototypical Greek creed, uh, we have several records of a variety of these. We looked at some of them last week. Uh, these would be used in baptism. They're sometimes called baptismal symbols, not like symbols, but like that's a symbol of a church in a little drawing, right? Uh, and they would be used uh, as a way of confessing the faith when being baptized. And so you can imagine all of these uh, church leaders gathered around saying, this is the faith that we confess. Yeah, I agree. This is the faith we confess. We should probably add that too. It's not a new thing. We believe that. We just didn't say it out loud, right? That's what's happening during this church council. We're clarifying. Okay, this thing that has been spread is out of bounds. Why is it out of bounds? What do we believe? Uh, I'm interested to hear. So in reading some of these baptismal symbols, uh, you probably see a lot of callbacks to the Apostles' Creed in here. The Apostles' Creed was also formed from these. Um, what are some just big, big stroke areas? Not specific language, like they should add these words, but like what is underdeveloped, would you say, that needs to be added? The purpose of Jesus coming. The purpose of Jesus coming and say that again? Yes. We need some more oof in that language, right? Uh, like that, it's not like it's absent, but it is. It could be driven home all the more strongly. It's sort of like you know when you give directions to your kids, uh, and you go, "I thought I was clear. Turns out I wasn't clear at all." And I need to say that again, but with more emphasis. Say it differently. Absolutely. So for uh, you make a great point, Krista. Both. The Son and the Spirit are kind of, uh, yeah, a little bit ambiguous there. What else? Anything else? It doesn't clarify why he was crucified. Okay, yeah, it just says that he was crucified. That's very good. Yes, it notes that he was crucified, notes that he died, uh, doesn't give us reason. So there's a doctrine of salvation that can be more fully orbed would be the nerdy way to say that. Yeah, Greg. Yeah, so I think, yeah, great. Like sinless perfection could be emphasized. Something more of the, the, the life of Christ for sure could be added in there. That's great. Now, anything else? Thinking about areas specifically and the claims that Arius was making. Anything else that could be added to this? Holy to, Spirit, okay, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Again, we need to flesh that out. And in the back, Caleb? Concept, I don't like you very much. You should, you should Google. You should read. I don't have time to dive into it. Caleb is a super smart person. Uh, the, the doctrine of, uh, yeah, so just Google consubstantial Nicaea would be helpful. Um, that's, that's a long debate. But yes, uh, so something of the, the substance of the Trinity and being of like essence, nature, that could be clarified. Yeah, one more. So, no, not about this point, but I think the whole purpose, correct me if I'm wrong, the whole purpose of the creed is to unite not to clarify anything, is to say, like, hey, if you are a Christian here and you're a Christian in another part of the world, we both talk about the same Christ. Yes, yeah, yeah. Is so, that yes, that, that's great. Yeah, so what, what Sri just said, for those of you who can't hear because he didn't have a mic, he's saying the purpose of this creed really is to unite, is to state our common faith, right? It's not necessarily polemical, meaning it's not, it's not targeted as an, an against apart from defining Christian doctrine from the world, but it's not, it's not got a needle point on it going, that guy back there, we've got to fix his particular issue. It is trying to clarify the rule of faith. We've talked about this before, the, the common faith that is held, the, the, the outline of the building. Uh, and so that's great. Shree's pointing out uh, there's a reason. It's not like this is a failure. It's a horrible creed because it's not going after this one particular aberration of the faith. That's not its, its design purpose. Yeah, one more back there, and then we'll be done. I saw a hand go up. Maybe I'm just being a Baptist pastor, and I see hands everywhere. Oh, yeah, John. I think in light of Arius, um, like the highlighting that Jesus was not created or not made. Yes. That is, yeah, dead on, right? So the particular heresy is saying he's a big deal. 
He just, at one point, wasn't because he didn't exist. And then he became a big deal. So we need something of his, we need greater clarity on like eternally begotten. Like what does that mean? Was there a time when he was not? Because we're using, again, similar vocabulary, different dictionaries. So let's dive in to the Nicene Creed, the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed. Um, this is kind of its, its final form. Um, if you're wondering, again, just pointing out resources, if, if you want to see a kind of a comparison of the first edition and then the second one, uh, you can look at uh, Fairbairn's book. Uh, it's in the chapter on the Nicene Creed. You can also just do a Google search and find it. Uh, they're not substantially different apart from the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, which is elaborated, uh, and then a few other um, additions, just kind of clarifying some things that happen in the debate afterwards. But we're going to spend the rest of our time just kind of walking through this. What I want you to know is similarity and elaboration, right? Similarity and elaboration. It's not like they took a red pen, sat down together and said, this all has been terrible. In fact, we're just going to... You got any scissors? I'm going to take out a big knife, cut that out of there. We need to add this in, right? That's not what's happening. We're going, huh, we were fuzzy there. We could be a little bit more explicit. We need to say a few more words. So let's walk through this together. I'm just going to point out language that is new to this particular creed uh, from the one that you just looked at. So you'll notice a ton of similarities, including the way it begins. I believe in one God. The Father. And by the way, this breakdown is brought to you by the brilliance of Spencer Haygood. Sorry, I should have clarified that at the beginning. The reason it's laid out the way it is, is it's helpful for us to see if you've ever diagrammed sentences. This is, this is what this is doing. It's helping you to see what's an elaboration on the previous sentence, what's a new statement, right? You'll notice there are three headings to this. This is a major feature of creeds that were meant to be used in a local church service. The three parts in the balance of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. So I believe in one God. Who is that God? The Father. What kind of Father? Almighty. What did He do? He's the maker of what? Of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. So, of heaven and earth is Apostles' Creed language. It's not in the, the creed you just read, right? But you notice, like, you can almost see the, the process beginning. What could somebody take wrong here, right? The, the previous creed said that He was the maker of all things visible and invisible, which is pretty comprehensive. We want to state that even more concretely of heaven and earth. Combine those two things together. Likely that was language that this church over here used, right? This church said of all things visible and invisible. They said heaven and earth. We just said, let's stick them all together. It's all really helpful, right? So this is the doctrine of God the Father. It's comparatively short. It is pretty clear. Why? Does anybody know? This is not a rhetorical question. I would love an answer any, any idea why this might be the shortest of the three? Is it the least important? Needed the least clarified. That's it. John Hamilton for the win. It needed the least clarified. Right? They're not saying it's not important. It's just if you were to interview somebody in the area in controversy and all that's going on, they would be like, yeah, I know who God the Father is. Like that, that's not what we're arguing about here. That's not what's being debated. It needed the least clarifying. So that's why it's the shortest, again, not because it's the least important. Next. So this is the second kind of heading here. You see it bolded for that reason. They didn't bold it when they wrote it. Uh, they didn't have Microsoft Word. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ. Again, that's from the previous, uh, previous creed. The only begotten Son. Son of who? Of God. All right, Arius would agree. In fact, by the way, small sidebar. We have Athanasius, who's going to be very important in a couple of weeks. Uh, he is at this council as kind of an assistant to Alexander the bishop, the bishop of Alexandria. Uh, Athanasius is a deacon at this point. He's kind of holding papers and following around, paying attention. Athanasius is going to give his life for the defense of Nicene Christology. And he wrote some letters from the council that you can read. You can find them online. And he talks about, as they're formulating this, you have Arians in the room who, as this is being read, he literally says this, they're winking and they're snickering to one another, going, yeah, we believe that, we're fine. Like, as this is being written, and they see one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds. They're going, yeah, 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 I mean, no, we say, we say that Arius said that, right? You can read Athanasius actually narrating the process. It's fascinating. I'd encourage you to check it out. This is new. God of God. Light of light. Very God of very God. Begotten not made, being of one substance, Caleb, with the Father, right? This is new, 
right? This is where you can see some major, not departure, right? It's not, it's not different in a new way, clarification of the meaning of the words in the previous creeds. So again, picture the Arian snickering. Yeah, we believe he's begotten of the Father of the four worlds. Didn't you read Arius said that? God of God. Oh, light of light. How do you emphasize that? Very God of very God, right? It just gets more explicit. Begotten, not made. Now you'll note the doctrine of, of what it means to be begotten, um, the Genesis clause is sometimes called, is not fully elaborated here. What is elaborated is begotten doesn't mean came into being like it typically means, right? There's a whole argument about Greek here, but typically when we use the phrase like I begat a son, and we see this again in the New Testament like in Matthew, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, it does mean born and new. However, the Bible doesn't support the argument that Jesus was created, born and new, because it describes him as eternally existing with the Father. So it can't mean that. It's fair that there's some clarification needed. That's why they put in the phrase, begotten, not made. What kind of very God of very God is he? He is of one substance with the Father. He is with the Father of the same substance. That, that is new clarification language. All right. By whom all things were made. Do you notice the difference if you flip back to the, the Greek creeds? This is an intensification. It's not new language. It is more intense language. It doesn't say through whom. It says by whom. That's, that's an important change, right? If everything's created through him, that's not, as, that's not as clear as, like, there's a category of Jesus who is with God, and then everything comes from him. Like, you, you kind of argue that it's mushy. So, by whom all things were made is an intensification of through whom all things were made. Now, this is similar language. Who for us, the previous creed says that, and then it clarifies, Priscilla, men in our salvation. You guys remember Priscilla said, like, we need some clarification about, like, why Jesus came, why he died. This puts that in there, right? For Who for us, men and our salvation, came down from heaven and was incarnate. That's similar language. By the Holy Spirit. That's new language of the Virgin Mary. So you, you can see what's going on here and, and the need to state the purpose. Notice where they put it, too. This is really important. They don't say, oh, yeah, he came for us in our salvation when he died. No, the incarnation is for us in our salvation as well, right? So some of that is referring to some of that language Greg was mentioning that we needed. Something about his life, the way he lived, right? When, when is he doing salvation work? Well, it's not at the cross. That's not when that starts. No, it, it's all the way before. Like, he became incarnate for us in our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate, not just of the Virgin Mary, but by the Holy Spirit, and was made man. No, notice again, here the emphasis and clarification. He was made man. That language is not in the previous creed. So he, he wasn't man, and then he was made man. He's different than man, right? He was made man and was crucified also for us. Again, that's, that's reason language. For us, under Pontius Pilate. Pilate is never getting off the hook, ever. Unto eternity. His name lives in infamy. But you can see what they're doing there. They're clarifying. Why is it that he came? Why is it that he died? Again, for us in our salvation. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. This is also important and will lead to some more controversies in church history in the future. He suffered. He suffered. He didn't just die. He actually suffered, stating... Like, he really actually endured great suffering. It wasn't just he ceased to be man at some point. But he suffered and was buried. That's back to the previous creed. And was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. This is all similar language. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. He shall come again with glory to judge. And then I just, I love this translation. The quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. I always think of like the, po I've never actually seen the movie, but the poster for the Western movie, The Quick and the Dead, it's based on this language. Um, yes, it, some, some translations say the living and the dead. This is pulled from Justin Holcomb's book that Spencer was uh, modifying here. But he's going to come to judge the living and the dead. State something of an eschatology there. Again, notice uh, this language did not need clarification. But the clarification that happened about who Jesus was changes the way we read everything that came before. It has even greater significance. All right, real quick, as we move towards the end here. And I believe in the Holy Ghost. You could say Holy Spirit. 
Numa, same word. Don't read anything into ghosts. It's not like, oh, we thought he was a, a ghost like at Halloween, but then we figured out he was actually a person. That, that's not what's happening here. Uh, it's just the language that church history has used. The Lord ooh, and giver of life. This is new language uh, from the Apostles' Creed, I believe. Sorry, I check my notes here. Um, yeah, it, the Lord is the new language, right? He is the giver of life, but He is also divine. He's the Lord. And then this is very new language. Who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. So you see what's happening here. This is now a doctrine of the divinity of the Holy Spirit. The first version of the Nicene Creed doesn't have this. That's added, Constantinople. It just previously said, I believe in the Holy Spirit. So, we now have a clear doctrine. He's, he's receiving the same worship. Who, who do you worship? You worship God, right? He's receiving the same worship as the Father and the Son. It's not like we worship those guys. He's pretty great, too. No, with the Father and the Son, He is worshiped and glorified. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. He's not just the Father's assistant, right? He is actually the helper, the third person of the Godhead who proceeds from the Father and the Son. All right, last phrase. This is very similar language. And I believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. I heard somebody ask the question, like, why are both of those in there? Catholic being universal. So this is not like just, just our sect or this council. It's of all people at all time that belong to God. And then also apostolic, meaning we ain't doing nothing new. They probably wouldn't have phrased it in my Alabama slang. But like, this is from the apostles. This is in line with what has come before. It's an apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I heard somebody mention we could use some more clarification about baptism, and indeed we could. We will get that later on. And I look for the resurrection of the dead. The language changes there to a sense of expectation. I'm looking for it. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. All right, so you can see how this happens. I hope, just to sum up, as we're getting ready to go, I hope you're noticing what's happening is not the emperor told a bunch of guys to go in a room and write doctrine, to figure out what we believe and to come up with it. No, there's this 2% difference on a really important issue. Christians gather together and they bring with them the practice and the faith that they practice in their churches. And they find these things are the same. And they clarify that. Yeah, Joel. I think it's probably fair to say that the, the clarification is going back to Scripture, saying this is a better expression of what's there already. Absolutely. Yes. It's not inventive in any sense. They're not figuring this out. Yes. They're just realizing that the scripture is correcting those inadequacy of the prior statements. A hundred percent correct. So what Joel just said is dead on. We didn't like include scripture references. You can find these again online if you'll Google Nicene Creed scripture references. What Joel said is what they're doing is they're going back to scripture. And they're clarifying from, what, from Scripture what Scripture is actually saying. They're not writing something outside of that. No, they're saying this aberration has arisen. What does the text say? From the text, we see these things, and we can state that more explicitly. So it is, it's not a uh, moving forward or an invention. Uh, remember, we talked about this last week. Doctrinal clarification is not the same as doctrinal invention. They're not making it up. They are going back to Scripture and clarifying what it says, which is, which is dead on. I hope the absence of Scripture references doesn't lead you to believe these are just made up. There's only so much paper in the world and so much time in the week. Uh, so you can check those out. And in fact, I would just point you to these last couple of resources here. Uh, chapter 2 and Know the Creeds and Councils is on the Nicene Creed and the Council of Nicaea. Uh, the Story of Creeds and Confessions by Fairbairn, that should be Fairbairn, and Ryan Reeves is excellent. The Way to Nicaea by John Baer. If you're in the cohort, John Baer is at St. Vladimir's Seminary uh, and helped publish the uh, two primary sources you're reading. So if you're doing that, he's a great guy to read, especially for your papers. Uh, and then Early Christian Doctrines by J.N.D. Kelly is a classic uh, on doctrinal development in the early church. I'd highly recommend it. It reads like an encyclopedia, so you can go find what you need. Read a bullet point there. Again, if you're in the cohort, great resources for your papers. We are out of time, so I'm going to pray for us. If you have questions, as always, I will be happy to stay around and talk. One last reminder before we go. This Saturday, my college football team doesn't matter anymore. So this Saturday, between 12 and 5, uh, we are going to be in this room uh, with about 100 folks uh, that are registered uh, right now to spend some time thinking about historical theology, the life of Augustine, the life of Martin Luther. We will be giving away a ton of books. Uh, we'll also provide lunch if you register. So there's some of you I know still that were here last time. You're like, I think I might be, haven't registered yet. We are ordering Chick-fil-A, I think, on Monday uh, so that they can have time to get it ready. 
kill the chickens, uh, spare the cows, all those things. So please register. You can do that through the website, through the QR code on the back of the chairs. But please do that. This is the last week. I won't make this announcement next week because it will be passed. Dr. Dusing will be with us and he'll be preaching on Sunday. Let me pray for us and then we will go. Father, we thank you so much for what we see in church history. We thank you. Just as Joel mentioned, it is not a departure for, from Scripture. It is a clarification of what Scripture actually says, even as we err. We thank you that your word is an unchanging standard of truth, that it is true, every word of it breathed out by the Holy Spirit through men who are carried along by the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that we would treasure it, and we would also treasure our history and see ourselves in line with the faith that has been delivered to the saints once and for all. We pray that you would help us as we wrestle with big words and difficult concepts. We pray that you help us to grow in our confidence in what we believe that it is what is in Scripture. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.